and welcome everybody to Paper Cuts. Uh, this week we're reading Alice in Wonderland. Isn't that neat? I figured what better way to start off the new uh, set of recordings or rather new you all, you all know broadly what I mean right you know what's what what better uh, you know work to start with than Alice in Wonderland which has been you know pretty popularly done from all over the place but let us begin with chapter one down the rabbit hole Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and of having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? So she was considering in her own mind, as well as she could, for the hot day made her feel very sleepy and stupid whether the pleasure of making a daisy chain would be worth the trouble of getting up and picking the daisies, when suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran by her. There was nothing so very remarkable in that, and nor did Alice think it so very much out of the way to hear the rabbit say to itself, Oh dear, oh dear, I should be late. When she thought it over afterwards, it occurred to her that she ought to have wondered at this, but at the time it all seemed quite natural but when the rabbit actually took a watch out of its waistcoat pocket and looked at it and then hurried on, Alice started to her feet, for it flashed across her mind that she'd never before seen a rabbit with either a waistcoat pocket or a watch to take it out of, and burning with curiosity, she ran across the field after it, and fortunately it was just in time to see it pop down a large rabbit hole under the hedge. In another moment, down Alice went after it, never once considering how in the world she was to get out again. The rabbit hole went straight on like a tunnel for some way, and then dipped suddenly down, so suddenly that Alice had not a moment to think about stopping herself, before she found herself falling down a very deep well. Either the well was very deep, or she fell very slowly, for she had plenty of time as she went down to look about her and to wonder what was going to happen next. First she tried to look down and make out what she was coming to, but it was too dark to see anything, and then she looked at the sides of the well and noticed that they were filled with cupboards and bookshelves. Here and there she saw maps and pictures hung upon pegs. She took down a jar from one of the shelves as she passed and noted it was labeled orange marmalade, but to her great disappointment it was empty. She didn't like to drop the jar for fear of, fear of killing somebody, so managed to put it in one of the cupboards as she fell past it. Well, thought Alice to herself, after such a fall as this I shall think nothing of tumbling downstairs. How brave they will all think me at home. Why, I wouldn't say anything about it even if I fell off the top of the house, which was very likely true. Down, down, down. Would the fall never come to an end? I wonder how many miles I've fallen by this time, she said aloud. I must be getting somewhere near the center of the earth. Let me see, that would be four thousand miles down, I think. For you see, Alice had learnt several things of this sort in her lessons in the schoolroom, and though this was not a very good opportunity for showing off her knowledge, as there was no one to listen to her, still it was good practice to say it over. Yes, that's about the right distance, but then I wonder what latitude or longitude I've gotten to. Alice had no idea what latitude was, nor longitude either, but thought they were nice grand words to say. Presently she began again. I wonder if I shall fall right through the earth. How funny it'll seem to come out among the people that walk with their hands downward. The antipathies, I think. She was rather glad there was no one listening to her at this time, because it didn't sound like at all the right word. But I shall have to ask them what, what the name of the country is. You know, please, ma'am, is this New Zealand or Australia? And she tried to curtsy as she spoke. Fancy curtsying as you're following through the air. Do you think you could manage it? And what an ignorant little girl she'll think me for asking. No, no, it'll never do to ask. Perhaps I'll see it written up somewhere. 
Oh, you'll have to excuse all my yawns. I get very yawny when I start using my voice at length, whether it be singing or speaking. It used to be just singing, now it's mostly speaking. Anyway, I digress. Down, down, and yet further down. There was nothing else to do, so Alice soon began talking again. Dinah missed me very much tonight, I should think. Dinah was her cat. I hope they'll remember her saucer of milk at tea time. Dinah, my dear, I wish you were down here with me. There are no mice in the air, I'm afraid, but you might catch a bat, and that's very much like a mouse, you know. Do cats eat bats, I wonder? And here Alice began to get rather sleepy. And went on saying to herself in a dreamy sort of way, Do cats eat bats? Do cats eat bats? And... Sometimes do bats eat cats? For you see, she couldn't answer either question, so it didn't much matter which, I, which way she put it. She felt she was dozing off and had just begun to dream that she was walking hand in hand with Dinah and saying to her very earnestly, Now, Dinah, tell me the truth. Did you ever eat a bat? When suddenly, thump, thump, down she came upon a heap of sticks and dry leaves and the fall was over. Thankfully, Alice was not a bit hurt, and she jumped up to her feet in a moment. She looked up, but it was all dark overhead. And before her was another long passage, and the white rabbit was still in sight, hurrying down it. There was not a moment to be lost. Away went Alice like the wind, and was just in time to hear it say as it turned a corner. Oh, my ears and whiskers, how late it's getting. She was close behind when she turned the corner, but the rabbit was no longer to be seen. She found herself in a long, low hall, which was lit up by a row of lamps hanging from the roof. <sighs> there were doors all round the hall, but they were all locked, and when Alice had been all the way down one side and up the other, trying every door, she walked sadly down the middle, wondering how she was ever to get out again. Then suddenly she came upon a three-legged table, all made of solid glass. There was nothing on it except a tiny golden key, and Alice's first thought was that it might belong to one of the doors of the hall, but, alas, either the locks were too large or the key was too small, but at any rate it wouldn't open any of them. <sighs> However, on the second time around, she came upon a low curtain she hadn't noticed before, and behind it was a little door and with a that was uh, rather and behind it was a little door about fifteen inches high. She tried the little golden key in the lock, and to her great delight it fitted. Alice opened the door and found that it led into a small passage, not much larger than a rat hole. She knelt down and looked along the passage into the loveliest garden you ever saw. How she longed to get out of that dark hall and wander about among those beds of bright flowers and those cool fountains, but she couldn't even get her head through the doorway. And even if my head would go through, so thought poor Alice, it would be of very little use without my shoulders. Oh, how I wish I could shut up like a telescope. I think I could, well, if I could only knew how to begin. For you see, so many out-of-the-way things had happened lately that Alice had begun to think that very few things were indeed impossible. Mm. There seemed to be no use in waiting by the little door, so she went back to the table, half hoping she might find another key on it, or at any rate a book of rules for shutting people up like telescopes and this time she found a little bottle on it, which certainly wasn't here before, said Alice. And round the neck of the bottle was a paper label, with the words Drink Me beautifully printed on it in large letters. It was all very well to say Drink Me, but the wise little Alice wasn't going to do that in a hurry. No, I'll look first and see whether it's marked poison or not. For she'd read several nice little histories about children who got burnt and eaten up by wild beasts and un other unpleasant things, all because they wouldn't remember the simple rules their friends had taught them, such that a 
red hot poker would burn you if you'd hold it too long, or a knife would cut your finger very deeply, and then it would bleed usually. She'd never forgotten that if you drink much from a bottle marked poison, it's almost certainly to disagree with you at least sooner or later. However, the bottle wasn't marked poison, so Alice ventured to taste it and finding it very nice. It had, in fact, a sort of mixed flavor of cherry tart, custard, pineapple, roast turkey, toffee, and hot buttered toast, that she very soon finished it off. What a curious feeling, said Alice. I, I must be shutting up like a telescope. And her face brightened up at the thought that she was now the right size for going through the little door into that lovely garden. First, however, she waited for a few minutes to see if she was going to shrink any further. She felt a little nervous about this, for it might end, you know, Alice said to herself, in my going out altogether like a candle. I wonder what I should be like then. And she tried to fancy what the flame of a candle is like after the candle is blown out, for she couldn't remember ever having seen such a thing. After a while, finding that nothing more happened, she decided on going into the garden at once. But alas for poor Alice. When she got to the door, she found she'd forgotten the little golden key, and when she went back to the table for it, she found she couldn't possibly reach it. She could see it quite plainly through the glass, and tried her best to climb up one of the legs of the table, but it was too slippery. And when she had tired herself out with trying, the poor little thing sat down and cried. Come, there's no use in crying like that, said Alice to herself rather sharply. I advise you to leave off this minute. She generally gave herself very good advice, though she very seldom followed it. And sometimes she scolded herself so severely as to bring tears into her eyes. And once she remembered trying to box her own ears for having cheated herself, in a game of croquet she was playing against herself, for the curious child was very fond of pretending to be two people. But it's no use now, thought poor Alice, to pretend to be two people. Why, there's hardly enough of me left to make one respectable person. But soon enough her eye fell on a little glass box that was lying under the table. She opened it and found, it in, a very s and found in it a very small cake on which the words eat me were beautifully marked in currants. Well, I'll eat it, said Alice, and if it makes me grow larger, I can reach the key, and if it makes me grow smaller, I can creep under the door. Either way, I'll be able to get into the garden, and I don't care which happens. She ate a little bit and said anxiously to herself, which way, which way, holding her hand on the top of her head to feel which way it was growing, and she was quite surprised to find that she remained the same size. To be sure, this generally happened when one eats cake, but Alice had got so much into the way of expecting nothing but out-of-the-way things to happen that it seemed quite dull and stupid for life to go on in the common way. So she set to work, and very soon finished off the cake. Chapter 2. The Pool of Tears Hang on, can you all hear that? Okay, it's very, very distant for you all, so it'll probably be just fine to let it live its life. I'm not sure which Alexa in the house is going off, but, uh, you know, that's a sure, that sure is a thing that exists. One of my family members will get it, probably, maybe. Anyway, chapter two. The Pool of Tears. Curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. She was so much surprised that, for the moment... She quite forgot how to speak good English. Now I'm opening out like the largest telescope that ever was. Goodbye, feet. For when she looked down at her feet, they seemed to be almost out of sight they were getting out so far off. Oh, my poor little feet, I wonder who will put, you, put on your shoes and stockings for you now, dears. I'm sure I shan't be able. I shall be a great deal too far off to trouble myself about you. You must manage the best way you can, but I must be kind to them thought Alice, or perhaps they won't walk the way I want to go. Let me see, I'll give them a pair of new boots every Christmas. And so she went on planning to herself how she would manage it. It must go by the carrier, she thought, and how funny it'll seem, sending presents to one's own feet, and how odd the directions must look. 
Alice's right foot, Esquire, here thronged near the fender with Alice's love. Oh dear, what nonsense I'm talking. And just then her head struck against the roof of the hall. In fact, she was now more than nine feet high, and she at once took up the little golden key and hurried off to the garden door. Poor Alice. It was as much as she could do, lying down on one side, to look through into the garden with one eye. But to get through was more hopeless than ever. She sat down and began to cry again. "'You ought to be ashamed of yourself,' said Alice. "'A great girl like you, she might well say this, "'to go on crying in this way. "'Stop this moment, I tell you.' "'But she went on all the same, shedding gallons of tears, "'until there was a large pool all round her, "'about four inches deep and reaching half down the hall. "'After a time she heard a little pattering of feet in the distance, "'and she hastily dried her eyes to see what was coming.' It was the white rabbit, returning, splendidly dressed, with a pair of white kid gloves in one hand and a large fan in the other. He came trotting along in a great hurry, muttering to himself as he came. Oh, the Duchess! Oh, the Duchess! Oh, won't she be savage if I've kept her waiting? Alice felt so desperate that she was ready to ask help of any one. So when the rabbit came near her, she began in a low, timid voice, If you please, sir. The rabbit startled violently dropped the white kid gloves in the fan, and scurried away into the darkness as hard as he could go. Alice took up the fan and gloves, and as the hall was very hot, kept fanning herself all the time as she went on talking. Oh dear, oh dear, how strange everything is today. And yesterday things went on just as usual. I wonder if I've been changed in the night. Let me think, was I the same when I got up this morning? I can almost think I can remember feeling a little different. But if I'm not the same, then the next question is, who in the world am I? Oh, that's the great puzzle. And she began thinking over all the children she knew that were of the same age as herself, to see if she could have changed, she could have been changed for any of them. I'm sure I'm not Ada. Her hair goes in such long ringlets, and mine doesn't go in ringlets at all. And I'm sure I can't be Mabel, for I know all sorts of things, and she, oh, she knows such a very little... Besides, she, she, and I'm I, and, oh dear, how puzzling all it is. I'll try if I know all the things I used to know. Let me see. Four times five is twelve, and four times six is thirteen, and four times seven is... Oh dear, I shall never get to twenty at that rate. The multiplication table doesn't signify. Let's try geography. London's the capital of Paris, and Paris the capital of Rome, and Rome, and... Well, no, that's all wrong. I'm certain... I must have been changed for Mabel. I'll try and say how doth the little... And she crossed her hands on her lap as if she were saying lessons, and began to repeat it, but her voice sounded hoarse and strange, and the words didn't come the same as they used to do. Hmm. How doth the little crocodile improve his shining tail, And pour the waters of the Nile on every golden scale? How tearfully he seems to grin, and how neatly spread his claws, And welcome little fishes in with gently smiling jaws. Oh, I'm not sure those are... I'm sure those are the not the right words, said poor Alice, And her eyes filled with tears again as she went on. I must be Mabel, after all, and I shall have to go and live in that pokey little house, and have next to no toys to play with, and oh, ever so many lessons to learn. Now I've made up my mind about it. If I'm Mabel, I'll stay down here. It'll be no use putting their heads down and saying, Come up again, dear. I shall only look up and say, Who am I, then? Tell me that first, and then if I like being that person, I'll come up. If not, I'll stay down here till I'm somebody else. But oh, dear cried Alice, with a sudden burst of tears. I do wish they would put their heads down. I'm so very tired of being all alone down here. As she said this, she looked down at her hands and was surprised to see that she had put on one of the rabbit's little white kid gloves while she was talking. How can I have done that? She thought. I must be growing small again. She got up and went to the table to measure herself by it and found that as nearly as she could guess, she was about two feet high, and she was going on shrinking rapidly. She soon found out that this, the cause of this was the fan she was holding, and she dropped it hastily, 
just in time to avoid shrinking away altogether. Now that was a narrow escape, said Alice, said Alice, a good deal frightened at the sudden change, but very glad to find herself still in existence. And now for the garden! And she ran with all her speed back to the little door, but alas, the little door was lying shut again, and the little, and the little golden key was lying on the glass table as before. And things are worse than ever, thought the poor child, for I never was so small as all this before, never, and I declare it's too bad that, that it is. As she said these words, her foot slipped, and in another moment splash. She was up to her chin in salt water. Her first idea that was she'd somehow that was uh, her first idea was that she had somehow fallen into the sea, and in that case I can go back by railway, she said to herself. Alice had been to the seaside once in her life, and had come to the general conclusion that wherever you go on the English coast you find a number of bathing machines in the sea. Some children digging in the sand with wooden spades, then a row of lodging houses, and behind them a railway station. However, she soon made out that she was in the pool of tears which she had wept when she was nine feet high. Oh, I wish I hadn't cried so much, said Alice, as she swam about, trying to find her way out. Oh, sh I shall be punished for it now, I suppose, by being drowned in my own tears. That will be such a strange thing, to be sure. However, everything is just so strange today. Just then she heard something splashing about in the pool a little way off, and she swam nearer to make out what it was. At first she thought it must be a walrus or hippopotamus, then she remembered how small she was now, and soon made out that it was only a mouse that had slipped in like herself. Would it be any u would it be of any use now, thought Alice, to speak to this mouse? Everything is so out of the way down here that I should think very likely it can talk. At any rate, there's no harm in trying. And so she began. Oh, mouse, do you know the way out of this pool? I'm very tired of swimming about here, oh, mouse. Alice thought this must be the right way of speaking to a mouse. She'd never done such a thing before, but she remembered having seen in her brother's Latin grammar a mouse of a mouse to a mouse, a mouse, oh, mouse. The mouse looked at her rather inquisitively and seemed to her to wink with one of its little eyes but said nothing perhaps it doesn't understand english thought alice i dare say it's a french mouse come over with william the conqueror for with all her knowledge of history alice had no very clear notion how long ago anything had happened so she began again Où est ma chatte? which was the first sentence in her French lesson book. The mouse gave a sudden leap out of the water and seemed to quiver all over with fright. Oh, I beg your pardon, cried Alice hastily, afraid that she'd hurt the poor animal's feelings. I quite forgot you didn't like cats. Not like cats, cried the mouse in a shrill, passionate voice. Would you like cats if you were me? Well, perhaps not said Alice in a soothing tone. D don't be angry about it, and yet I wish I could show you to our cat Dinah. I think you'd take a fancy to cats if you could only see her. She is such a dear, quiet thing. Alice went on half to herself as she swam lazily about in the pool, and she sits purring so nicely by the fire. And she sits purring so nicely by the fire, licking her paws and washing her face. And she's just such a soft, nice thing to nurse. She's such a capital one for catching mice. Oh, oh! I beg your pardon, cried Alice once again. And for this time, the mouse was bristling all over. She felt certain it must be really offended. We won't talk about her any more if you'd rather not. We indeed, cried the mouse, who was trembling down to the end of its tail. As if I would talk on such a subject. Our family always hated cats. Nasty, low, vulgar things. Don't let me hear the name again. I... I won't indeed, said Alice, in a great hurry to change the subject to conversation. Are you... Are you fond of... Well, dogs? The mouse didn't answer, so Alice went on eagerly. 
There's such a nice little dog near our house. I should like to show you a little bright-eyed terrier, you know. Oh, with such long curly brown hair, and it'll fetch things when you throw them, and it'll sit up and beg for its dinner, and all sorts of things. I can't remember half of them. And it belongs to a farmer, you know. He says it's so useful, worth a hundred pounds. He says it kills all the rats, and oh, dear, cried Alice in a sorrowful tone. I'm afraid I've offended it again. For the mouse was swimming away from her, from her as hard as it could go, and making quite a commotion in the pool as it went. So she called softly after it, Mouse dear, do come back again. We won't talk about cats or dogs either if you don't like them. When the mouse heard this, Oh, that is to say, when the mouse heard this, it turned round and swam slowly back to her. Its face was quite pale with passion, Alice thought, and it said in a low, trembling voice, Let us get to the, let us get to the shore, and then I'll tell you my history, and you'll understand why, why it is I hate cats and dogs. It was high time to go, for the pool was getting quite crowded with birds and animals that had fallen into it. There was a duck and a dodo, a lorry and an eaglet, and several other curious creatures. Alice led the way, and the whole party swam to shore. They were indeed a strange-looking party that assembled on the bank. The birds with draggled feathers, the animals with their fur clinging close to them, and all dripping wet, cross, and uncomfortable. The first question, of course, was how to get dry again. They had a consultation about this, and after a few minutes it seemed quite natural to Alice to find herself talking familiarly with them, as if she had known them all her life. Indeed, she had, had, quite, she had quite a long argument with the lorry, who at last turned sulky and would only say, I am older than you and must know better. And this Alice would not allow without knowing how old it was, and as the lorry positively refused to tell its age, there was no more to be said. At last, the mouse, who seemed to be a person of authority among them, called out, Sit down, sit down, all of you. All sit, sit down, all of you, and listen to me. I'll make you dry soon enough. They all sat down at once in a large ring with the mouse in the middle. Alice kept her eyes anxiously fixed on it, for she felt sure she would catch a bad cold if she didn't get dry very soon. Mm -hmm, said the mouse with an important air. Are you all ready? This is the driest thing I know. Silence all round, if you please. William the Conqueror, whose cause was favored by the Pope, was soon submitted to by the English, who wanted leaders and had been of late much accustomed to usurpation and conquest. Edwin and Mork are the Earls of Mercy in Northumbria. Ugh, said the lorry with a shiver. <clears throat> I beg your pardon, said the mouse, frowning, but very politely. Did you speak? No, not I, said the lorry hastily. Mm, I thought you did, said the mouse. I proceed. Edwin and Norker, the Earls of Mercy in Northumbria, declared for him, and even Sticken, the patriotic Archbishop of Canterbury, found it advisable. Found what? said the duck. Found it, the mouse replied rather crossly. Of course you know what it means. I know what it means well enough when I find a thing, said the duck. It's barely a flog or a worm. The question is, what did the archbishop find? The mouse didn't notice this question, but hurriedly went on. Found it advisable to go with Edgar Aethling to meet William and offer him the crown. William's conduct at first was moderate, but the insolence of his Normans... How are you getting on now, my dear? It continued, turning to Alice as it spoke. Mm. As wet as ever, said Alice in a melancholy tone. It doesn't seem to dry me at all. In that case, said the dodo solemnly, rising to its feet, I move that the meeting adjourn for the immediate adoption of more energetic remedies. Mm, speak English, said the eaglet. I don't know the meaning of half those long words, and what's more, I don't believe you do either. And the eaglet bent down its head to hide a smile. Some of the other birds tittered audibly. What I was going to say, said the dodo in an offended tone, was that the best thing to get us dry would be a caucus race. What is a caucus race? said Alice, not that she wanted much to know, but 
The door would pause as if it thought somebody ought to speak, and nobody else seemed inclined to say anything. Why, said the dodo, the best way to explain it is to do it. And you might like to try the thing yourself some winter day. I'll tell you how the dodo managed it. First, it marked out a race course in a sort of circle. The exact shape doesn't matter. And then all the party were placed upon the course, here and there. There was no one, two, three, and away, but when they but they began running when they liked, and left off when they liked, so it was not easy to know when the race was over. However, when they had been running half an hour or so, and was quite dry again, the dodo suddenly called out, The race is over! And they all crowded round it, panting, and asked, But who won? The question, This question the dodo couldn't answer without a great deal of thought, and it sat for a long time with one finger pressed upon its forehead, the position in which you see, usually see Shakespeare in the pictures of him, while the rest waited in silence. At last the dodo said, Everybody has won, and all must have prizes. But who is to give the prizes? Quite a chorus of voices asked. Why, she, of course, said the dodo, pointing to Alice with one finger and the whole party at once crowded around her, calling out in a, a confused way, Prizes! Prizes! Alice had no idea what to do, and in despair she put her hand in her pocket and pulled out a box of comfits. Luckily the salt water hadn't gotten into it, and handed them round as prizes. There was exactly one apiece all round. Alright, question of the day, what are comfits? Comfits, a candy consisting of a nut, seed, or other center coated in sugar. Hmm. Doesn't sound half bad. But she must have a prize herself, you know, said the mouse. Of course, the dodo replied very gravely. What else have you got in your pocket? He went on, turning to Alice. Mm, only a thimble, said Alice sadly. Hand it over here. said the dodo, and then they all crowded around her once more while the dodo solemnly presented this thimble, saying, We beg your acceptance of this elegant thimble, and when it had finished this short speech, they all cheered. Alice thought the whole thing very absurd, but they all looked so grave she didn't dare to laugh, and as she couldn't think of anything to say, she simply bowed and took the thimble, looking as solemn as she could manage. The next thing was to eat the comfits. This caused some noise and confusion, as the bird, large birds complained that they couldn't taste theirs, and the small ones choked and had to be patted on the back. However, it was over at length, and they sat down again in a ring, and begged the mouse to tell them something more. "'You promised to tell me your history, you know,' said Alice, "'and why it is you hate C and D,' she added in a whisper, half afraid that it would be offended again." Mine is such a long and sad tale, said the mouse, turning to Alice and sighing. Well, it is a long tale, certainly, said Alice, looking down with wonder at the mouse's tail. But why do you call it sad? And so she kept puzzling on about it while the mouse was speaking, so that her idea of the tale was something like this. Fury said to a mouse that he met in the house, Let us go, let us both go to law. I will prosecute you. Come, I'll take no denial, for we must have a trial. This, Really, this morning, I have nothing to do. Said the mouse to a cur, Such a trial, dear sir. With no jury or judge, we would... With no jury or judge, would both be wasting our breath. I'll be the judge, I'll be the jury, said the cunning old fury. I'll try the whole cause, and condemn you to death. "'You're not attending,' said the mouse to Alice severely. "'What are you thinking of?' "'I beg your pardon,' said Alice very humbly. "'You had got to the fifth bend, I think.' "'I had not!' cried the mouse sharply and very angrily. "'A knot,' said Alice, always ready to make herself useful and looking anxiously about her. "'Oh, do let, do let me help to undo it.' "'I shall do nothing of the sort,' said the mouse, getting up and walking away. You insult me by talking such nonsense. I, I didn't mean it, pleaded poor Alice. 
But you're so easily offended, you know. The mouse only growled in reply. Please, come back and finish your story. Alice called after it, and the others all joined in chorus. Yes, please do. But the mouse only shook its head impatiently and walked a little cl- walked a little quicker. What a pity it couldn't stay, sighed the lorry as soon as it was out of sight. And an old crab took the opportunity of saying to her daughter, Yeah, my dear, let this be a lesson to you to never lose your temper. Hold your tongue, pa, said the young crab a little snappishly. You have enough to try the patience of an oyster. I wish I had our Dinah here, I know I do, said Alice aloud, addressing nobody in particular. She'd soon fetch it back. But who is Dinah if I might venture to ask the question, said the lorry. Alice replied eagerly, for she was always ready to talk about her pet. Dinah's her cat, and she's such a capital one for catching mice you can't think. Oh, and I wish you could see her after the birds. Why, she'll eat a little bird as soon as look at it. The speech caused a remarkable sensation among the party. Some of the birds hurried off at once. One old magpie began wrapping itself up very carefully, I re- remarking, I really must be going home. The night air doesn't suit my throat. And a canary called out in a trembling voice to his children, Come away, my dears. It's high time you were all in bed. On various pretexts, they all moved off, and Alice was soon left alone. Oh dear, I wish I hadn't mentioned Dinah, she said to herself in a melancholy tone. Nobody seems to like her down here, and I'm sure she's the best cat in the world. Oh my dear Dinah, I wonder if I shall ever see you any more. And here poor Alice began to cry again, for she felt very lonely and low-spirited. In a little while, however, she again heard a little pattering of footsteps in the distance, and she looked up eagerly, half hoping that the mouse had changed his mind and was coming back to finish his story. Chapter 4. The Rabbit Sends In a Little Bill It was the white rabbit, trotting slowly back again and looking anxiously about as it went, as if it had lost something, and she heard it muttering to itself, The Duchess! The Duchess, the Duchess, oh, my dear paws, oh, my fern whiskers, as she'll get me executed as sure as ferrets are ferrets. Where can I have dropped them, I wonder? Alice guessed in a moment that it was looking for the fan and the pair of white kid gloves, and she very good-naturedly began hunting about for them, but they were nowhere to be seen. Everything seemed to have changed since her swim in the pool, and the great hall with the glass table and the little door had vanished completely. Very soon the rabbit noticed Alice, as she went hunting about and called out to her in an angry tone. Why, Mary Ann, what are you doing out here? Run home this moment and fetch me a pair of gloves and a fan, quick now. And Alice was so much frightened that she ran off at once in the direction it pointed to, without trying to explain the mistake it had made. Mm, he took me for his housemaid, she said to herself as she ran. How surprised he'll be when he finds out who I am. But I'd better take him his fan and his gloves, and as if I can find them. As she said this, she came upon a neat little house, on the door of which was a bright brass plate with the name W. Rabbit engraved upon it. She went in without knocking and hurried upstairs, in great fear lest she should meet the real Marianne and be turned out of the house before she had found the fan and gloves. How odd it seems, Alice said to herself, to be going messages for a rabbit. I suppose Dinah will be sending me on messages next. And she began fancying the sort of thing that would happen. Miss Alice, come here directly and get ready for your walk. Coming in a minute, nurse, but I've got to see that the mouse doesn't get out. Only I don't think, Alice went on, that they'd let Dinah stop in the house if it began ordering people about like that. By this time, she'd found her way into a tidy little room with a fan, with a table in the window, and on it, as she'd hoped, a fan and two or three pairs of tiny white kid gloves. She took up the fan and a pair of gloves, and she was just going to leave the room when her eye fell upon a little bottle that stood near the looking glass. There was no label this time with the words, Drink Me, but nevertheless she uncorked it and put it to her lips. I know something interesting sure to happen, she said to herself, 
whenever I eat or drink anything. So I'll just see what this bottle does. I do hope it'll make me grow large again, for really I'm quite tired of being such a tiny little thing. It did so indeed, and much sooner than she had expected. Before she had drank half the bottle, she'd found her head pressing against the ceiling and had to stoop to save her neck from being broken. She hastily put down the bottle, saying to herself, That's quite enough. I hope I shan't grow any more. As it is, I can't get out the door. I would too wish I hadn't drunk so much. Alas, it was too late to wish that. She went on growing and growing, and very soon she had to kneel down on the floor. In another minute there was not even room for this, and she tried the effect of lying down with one elbow against the door, and the other arm curled around her head. Still, she went on growing, and as a last resource she put one arm up out of the window, and one foot up the chimney, and said to herself, Now I can do no more, whatever happens. What will become of me? Luckily for Alice, the little magic bottle had now had its full effect, and she grew no larger. Still, it was very uncomfortable, and as there seemed to be no sort of chance of her ever getting out of the room again, no wonder she felt unhappy. It was always much pleasanter at home, thought poor Alice, when one wasn't always growing larger and smaller, being ordered about by mice and rabbits. I almost wish I hadn't gone down that rabbit hole, and yet... Yet it's rather curious, you know, this sort of life. I do wonder what can have happened to me. When I used to read fairy tales, I fancied that kind of thing never happened. And now here I am in the middle of one. There ought to be a book written about me. That there ought. And when I grow up, I'll write one. But I'm grown up now, she added in a sorrowful tone. At least there's no room for me to grow up here any more. But then, shall I never get any older than I am now? That'll be a comfort one way, never to be an old woman, but then always to have lessons to learn. Oh, I shouldn't like that. Oh, you foolish Alice, she answered herself. How can you learn lessons in here? Why, there's hardly room for you and no room at all for any lesson books. And so she went on, taking one side and then the other, and making quite a conversation of it all together. But after a few minutes she heard a voice outside and stopped to listen. Marianne, Marianne, said the voice, fetch me my gloves this moment. Then came a little pattering of feet on the stairs. Alice knew it was the rabbit coming to look for her, and she trembled till she shook the whole house. Quite forgetting, she was now about a thousand times as large as the rabbit, and had no reason to be afraid of it. Presently, the rabbit came up to the door and tried to open it, but as the door opened inwards, Alice's elbow was pressed hard against it, and the attempt proved a failure. Alice heard it say to itself, Then I'll go round and get into the window. That you won't, thought Alice, and just after waiting until she fancied she th heard the rabbit just under the window, she suddenly spread out her hand and made a snatch in the air. She didn't get a hold of anything, but she heard a little shriek and a fall, and a crash of broken glass from which she concluded it was just possible. It had fallen into a cucumber frame or something of the sort. Next came an angry voice, the rabbits. Pat? Pat? Where are you? Then a voice she'd never heard before. Sure, then, I'm over here, digging for apples, your honor. Mm, digging for apples. Digging for apples, indeed, said the rabbit angrily. Here, come and help me out of this mess. Sounds of more broken glass emanate. Sorry, I appear to have <laughs> zoned out a little bit. Uh... <sighs> oh, I suppose this isn't a most this isn't the most dreadful book to zone out on. Anyway, next came in, next came the rabbit's voice. Oh, Pat, Pat, where are you? And then a voice she'd never heard before. 
Sure that I'm here. Digging for apples, Your Honor. Digging for apples, indeed, said the rabbit angrily. Here, come and help me out of this. Sounds of more broken glass emanated. Now tell me, Pat, what's that in the window? Well, sure, it's an arm, Your Honor. Oh, he pronounced it arm. Sure, it's an arm, Your Honor. An arm, you goose? Whoever saw one that size, why, it fills the whole window. Sure it does, Your Honor. But it's an arm for all that. Well, it's got no business there. Take it, take it away. It's got no business there, at any rate. Go and take it away. There was a long silence after this, and Alice could only hear whispers now and then, such as, Sure, I don't like it, Your Honor, at all at all. And do, do as I tell you again, coward. At last, she spread out her hand again, and you made another snatch in the wall. This time, there were two little shrieks and more sounds of broken glass. What a number of cute... What a number of cucumber frames there must be, thought Alice. I wonder what they'll do next. As for pulling me out of the window, I wish they could. I'm sure I don't want to stay in here any longer. She visited for some she waited for some time without hearing anything more. She waited for some time without hearing anything more, and at last came a rumbling of little cartwheels and the sound of a good many voices all talking together. But she made out the words. Where's the other ladder? Why, I hadn't thought to bring one, but one. Bill's got the other. Bill, fetch it, lad. Here, put them up at this corner. No, time together first. They don't reach half high enough yet. Oh, they'll do well enough. Don't particular. Uh, mind that loose slate. Oh, it's coming down. Heads below. Now, who did that? It was Bill, I fancy. Now, who did that? It was Bill, I fancy. Who's to go down the chimney? Nay, I shan't. You shall do it. Then I won't, then. Bill's to, Bill's to go down. Bill the Brickmaster says you're to go down the chimney. Oh, so Bill's got to come down the chimney, has he? Said Alice to herself. Shy, they seem to put everything upon Bill. I wouldn't be in Bill's place for a good deal. The fireplace is narrow to be sure, but I'm sure I can... The fireplace is narrow to be sure. I think I can kick a little. She drew her foot as far down the chimney as she could and waited until she heard a little animal. She couldn't... She drew her foot down as, as far down the chimney as she could and waited until she heard a little animal. She couldn't guess what it was. Scratching and scrambling about the chimney. <sighs> Sorry, I seem to be dozing off a little bit. Give me a moment to, uh refresh myself. I'm going to put up the VRB on the stream, but for those of you in the recording, it'll be only a moment. Oh, so Bill's got to come down the chimney, has he? said Alice to herself. Shy, they seem to put everything upon Bill. I wouldn't be in Bill's place for a good deal. This fireplace is too narrow to be sure, but I think I can kick a little. She drew her foot as far down the chimney as she could and waited until she heard a little animal. She couldn't guess of what sort it was. "'scratching and scrambling about in the chimney close above her. "'Then, saying to herself, "'This is Bill,' she gave one sharp kick "'and waited to see what would happen next. "'The first thing she heard was a general chorus of, "'There goes Bill!' "'And, the, and then the rabbit's voice along, "'Catch him, you by the hedge!' "'And then silence. "'Then another confusion of voices. "'Hold up his head. "'Randy, now, don't choke him. "'How was it, old fellow? "'What happened to you? "'Tell us all about it.' Last came a feeble, squeaking voice. That's Bill, thought Alice. Well, I hardly know. No more thinking. I'm better now, but I'm a deal too flustered to tell you. 
All I know is something comes up at me like a jack-in-the-box, and up I goes like a skyrocket. So you did, old fellow, said the others. We must burn the house down, said the rabbit's voice, and Alice called out loud as she could. If you do, I'll set Dinah at you. There was dead silence instantly, and Alice thought to herself, I wonder what they will do next. If they had any sense, they'd take the roof off. After a minute or two, they began moving about again, and Alice heard the rabbit say, A barrel full will do to begin with. A barrel full of what? thought Alice, but she had not long to doubt. For the next moment, a shower of little pebbles came rattling at the window, and some of them hit her in the face. I'll put a stop to this, she said to herself and shouted out, You better not do that again! which produced another dead silence. Alice noticed with some surprise that the pebbles were all turning into little cakes as they lay on the floor, and a bright idea came into her head. If I eat one of these cakes, she thought, it's sure to make some change in my size, and as it can't possibly make me larger, it must make me smaller, I suppose. And so she swallowed one of the cakes, and was delighted to find that she began shrinking directly. As soon as she was small enough to get through the door, she ran out of the house and found quite a crowd of little animals and birds waiting outside. The poor little lizard, Bill, was in the middle, being held up by two guinea pigs who were giving it something out of a bottle. They all made a rush at Alice the moment she appeared, but she ran off as hard as she could and soon found herself safe in a thick wood. The first thing I've got to do, said Alice to herself as she wandered about in the wood, is to grow my right size again. And the second thing I is to find my way into that lovely garden. I think that'll be the best plan. It sounded an excellent plan, no doubt, and was very neatly and simply arranged. The only difficulty was that she had not the smallest idea how to set about it. And while she was peering about anxiously among the trees, a little sharp bark just over her head made her look up in a great hurry. An enormous puppy was looking down at her with large round eyes and feebly stretching out one paw, trying to touch her. Poor little thing, thought, said Alice in a coaxing tone, and she tried to whistle to it. But she was terribly frightened all the time at the thought of it might be hungry, in which case it'd be very likely to eat her up in spite of all her coaxing. Hardly knowing what she did, she picked up a little bit of stick and held it out to the puppy whereupon the puppy jumped into the air off all its feet at once with a yelp of delight and brushed the stick and made be and made believe to worry it and then alice dodged behind a great thistle to keep herself from being run over and the moment she appeared on the other side the puppy made another rush at the stick and tumbled head over heels in its hurry to get a hold of it then alice think then alice thinking it was very like having a game of play with a cart horse and expecting every moment to be trampled under its feet, ran round the thistle again. Then the puppy began a series of short charges at the stick, running a little ways forward each time and a long way back, and barking hoarsely all the while, till at last it sat down a good way off, panting with its tongue hanging half out of its mouth and its great eyes half shut. This seemed to Alice a great opportunity for making her escape, and so she set off at once and ran until she was quite tired and out of breath, until the puppy's bark sounded quite faint in the distance. "'And yet what a dear little puppy it was,' said Alice, as she, le as she leant against a buttercup to rest herself, and fanned herself with one of the leaves. "'I should have liked teaching it tricks very much, if, if only it I've had the right size to do it. Oh, dear, I'd nearly forgotten I've got to grow up again. Let me see, how is it to be managed? I suppose I ought to eat or drink something or other, but great question is what? The great question certainly was what. Alice looked all round her at the flowers and the blades of grass, but she didn't see anything that looked like the right thing to eat or drink under the circumstances. There was a large mushroom growing near, about the same height as herself, and when she had looked under it, and on both sides of it and behind it, it occurred to her that she might as well look and see what was on the top of it. She stretched herself up on tiptoe and peeped over the edge of the mushroom, and her eyes immediately met those of a large caterpillar that was sitting on the top with its arms folded, quietly smoking a long hookah. 
and taking not the smallest notice of her or anything else. Chapter 5. Advice from a Caterpillar The Caterpillar and Alice looked at each other for some time in silence, and at last the Caterpillar took the hook out of its mouth and addressed her in a languid, sleepy voice. Who are you? said the Caterpillar. This wasn't an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice replied rather shyly, I, I, well, I hardly know, sir, just at present. At least I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed mm, several times since then. What do you mean by that? said the Caterpillar somewhat sternly. Explain yourself. I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, because I'm not myself, you see, said Alice. I don't see. I'm afraid I can't put it much more clearly, Alice be replied very politely. I can't understand it myself to begin with, and being so many different sizes in a day is ever so confusing. Mm, I wouldn't think so. Well, perhaps you haven't found it so yet. But when you have to turn a new chrysalis, you will some day, you know. And then after that new butterfly, it'll... I should think you'll feel it a little strange, won't you? Mm, not a bit. Well, perhaps your feelings may be different. All I know it is... All I know is it'll be very strange to me. You, said the caterpillar contemptuously. Who are you? Which brought them back to, again to the beginning of the conversation. Alice felt a little irritated at the caterpillars making such very short remarks, and she drew herself up and said very gravely, I think you ought to tell me who you are first. Why? Here was another puzzling question, and as Alice couldn't think of any good reason, as the caterpillar seemed to be in a very unpleasant state of mind, she simply turned away. Come back, I have something very important to say. This sounded promising, certainly. Alice turned and came back again. Now keep your temper. Is is that all? said Alice, swallowing down her anger as best she could. No. Alice thought she might as well wait as she had nothing else to do, and perhaps after all it might tell her something worth hearing. For some minutes it puffed away without speaking, but at last it unfolded its arms, took the hook out of its mouth again, and said, So you think you're changed, do you? I'm afraid I am, sir. I can't remember things as I used to be, and I, I don't keep the same size for ten minutes together. Can't remember what things, said the caterpillar. Well, I have tried to say how doth the busy little bee, but it came out all different. Alice replied in a very melancholy and startled voice. Repeat, you are old, Father William, said the caterpillar. Alice folded her hands and began. You are old, Father William, the young man said, and yet your hair has become very white, and yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain. But now that I am perfectly sure I have none, why I do it again and again. You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly fat. Yet you turned a back somersault in the door. Pray, what is the reason of that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his grey locks, I kept all my limbs very supple. By the use of this ointment, one shilling the box, allow me to sell you a couple? You are too old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak, for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finished the goose with the bones in the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took it to the law. I took to the law and argued each case with my wife, and the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has, ra has lasted the rest of my life. You are old, said the youth. One would hardly suppose that your eye was steady as ever. Yet you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I have answered three questions, and that is enough, said his father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off, or I'll kick you downstairs. Mm, 
That is not quite right, said the caterpillar. Not quite right, I'm afraid. Some of the words have gotten altered. Mm, it's wrong from beginning to end, said the caterpillar decidedly, and there was silence for some minutes. The caterpillar was first to speak. What size do you want to be? Oh, I'm not particular as to size, Alice hastily replied. Only one doesn't like to be changing so often, you know. I don't know. Alice said nothing. She'd never been so much contradicted in her life before, and she felt that she was losing her temper. Are you content now? Well, I should like to be a little larger, sir, if you wouldn't mind. Three inches of such a wretched height to be. It's a very good height indeed, said the caterpillar angrily, rearing itself upright as it spoke. It was exactly three inches high. But I'm not used to it, pleaded poor Alice in a piteous tone. And she thought of herself, I wish the creatures wouldn't be so easily offended. You'll get used to it in time, said the caterpillar. And it put the hookah into its mouth and began smoking again. Such a detestable habit, smoking. Don't start. This time Alice waited patiently until it chose to speak again. In a minute or two, that caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and yawned, once or twice, and then shook itself. Then it got down off the mushroom and crawled away in the grass, merely remarking as it went, One side will make you grow taller and the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what? The other side of what? Alice thought to herself. Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar, just as if she had asked it aloud. And in another moment, it was out of sight. Alice remained looking thoughtfully at the mushroom for a moment, trying to make out which were the two sides of it, as it was perfectly round, she found this a very difficult question. However, at last she stretched her arms around it as far as they could go, and broke off a bit of the edge with each hand. And now which is which, she said to herself, and nibbled a little, a little of the right hand bit to try the effect. The next moment she felt a violent blow underneath her chin. It had struck her foot. She was a good deal frightened by this very sudden change, but she felt there was no time to be lost, as she was shrinking rapidly. So she set to work at once to eat some of the other bit. Her chin was pressed so closely against her foot that there was hardly room to open her mouth, but she did it at last and managed to swallow a morsel of the left-hand bit. "'Come, my head's free at last,' said Alice, in a tone of delight, which changed into alarm in another moment." When she found that her shoulders were nowhere to be found, all she could see when she looked down was an immense length of neck which seemed to rise like a stalk out of a sea of green leaves that lay far below her. What can all that green stuff be, and where have my shoulders gotten to? And oh, my poor hands, how is it that I can't see you? She was moving them about as she spoke, but no result seemed to follow except perhaps a shaking among the distant green leaves. There seemed to be no chance of getting her hands up to her head, so she tried to get her head down to them, and was delighted to find that her neck would bend about easily in any direction, much like a serpent's. She had just succeeded in curving it down into a graceful zigzag, and was going to dive in among the leaves, which she found nothing to, which she found to be nothing but the tops of trees under which she had been wandering, when a sharp hiss made her draw back in a hurry. A large pigeon had flown into her face and was beating its wings. Serpent! screamed the pigeon. I I'm not a serpent. Let me alone. Serpent, I say again! repeated the pigeon, but in a more subdued tone, and added with a kind of sob, I tried every way, and nothing seems to suit them. I haven't the least idea of what you're on about, said Alice. I have tried the roots of trees, and I have tried banks, and I have tried hedges. The pigeon went on without attending to her. But those serpents, there's no pleasing them. Alice was more and more puzzled, but she thought there was no use in saying anything more until the pigeon had at least finished talking. 
As if, as if it wasn't trouble enough hatching the eggs, but I must be on the lookout for serpents night and day. Why I haven't had a wink of sleep these three weeks. I'm very sorry you've been annoyed, said Alice, who was beginning to see its meaning. And just as I'd taken the highest tree in the wood, continued the pigeon, raising its voice to a shriek, and just as I was thinking I should be free out at last, they must needs come wriggling come down from the sky, a serpent. But I'm not a serpent. I, I'm a... I'm a... Well, what are you? I can see you're trying to invent something. I, I, I'm a little girl, said Alice, rather doubtfully, as she remembered the number of changes she had gone through that day. A likely story indeed, said the pigeon in a tone of the deepest contempt. I've seen a good many little girls in my time, but never one with such a neck as that. No, no, you're a serpent, and there's no use denying it. I suppose you'll be telling me next you never tasted an egg. Well, I have tasted eggs, certainly, said Alice, who was a very truthful child. But little girls eat eggs quite as much as serpents do, you know. I don't believe it, said the pigeon. But if they do, why then they're a kind of serpent, that's all I can say. This was such a new idea to Alice that she was quite silent for a minute or two, which gave the pigeon the opportunity to add, You're looking for eggs, I know that well enough, and what does it matter to me whether you're a little girl or a serpent? It matters a good deal to me, said Alice hastily. But I'm not looking for eggs as it happens, and if I was, I shouldn't want yours. I don't like them raw. Well, be off then, said the pigeon in a skulky tone, and it settled down again into its nest. Alice crouched down among the trees as well as she could, for her neck kept getting entangled among the branches, and every now and then she had to stop and untwist it. After a while she remembered she still held the pieces of mushroom in her hands, and she set to work very carefully, nibbling first at one and then at the other, and growing sometimes taller and sometimes shorter, until she had finally succeeded in bringing herself down to her usual height. It was so long since she had been anything near the right size that it felt quite strange at first. But she got used to it in a few minutes, and began talking to herself as usual. Come, here's half my plan done now. How puzzling all these changes are. I'm never sure what I'm going to be from one minute to another. However, I've got, my, I've got myself back to the right size. The next thing is to get into that beautiful garden. How is that to be done, I wonder? As she said this, she came suddenly upon an open place, with a little house, about four feet high. Whoever lives here, thought Alice, it'll never do to come upon them this size. Why, I should frighten them out of their wits. So she began nibbling at the right-hand bit again, and didn't venture to go near the house, until she'd brought herself down to nine inches high. Chapter 6. Pig and Pepper for a minute or two, she stood looking at the house and wondering what to do next when suddenly a footman in livery came running out of the wood. She considered him to be a footman because he was in livery. Otherwise, judging by his face only, she would have called him a fish and rapped loudly at the door with his knuckles. It was opened by another footman in livery with a round face and large eyes like a frog. And both footmen, Alice noticed, had powdered hair that curled all over their heads. She felt very curious to know what it was all about, and crept a little way out of the wood to listen. The fish footman began by producing from under his arm a great letter, and began reading. It was nearly as large as himself, and this he handed over to the other, saying in a solemn tone, For the Duchess. An invitation from the queen to play croquet. The frog footman repeated in the same solemn tone, only changing the order of the words a little. From the queen, an invitation for the duchess to play croquet. And then they both bowed low and their curls got entangled together. Alice laughed so much at this that she had to run back into the wood for fear of their hearing her. And when she next peeped out, the fish footman was gone, 
and the other was sitting on the ground near the door, staring stupidly up into the sky. Alice went timidly up to the door and knocked. There's no sort of use in knocking, said the footman, and that's for two reasons. First, because I'm on the same side of the door as you are, and secondly, because they're making such a noise inside, no one could possibly hear you. And certainly there was a most extraordinary noise going on within, a constant howling and sneezing, and every now and again, a great crash as if a dish or kettle had been broken into pieces. Please, then, how am I to get in? There might be some sense in your knocking, the footman went on without attending to her, if we had the door between us. For instance, if you were inside, you might knock and I could let you out, you know. He was looking up into the sky all the time he was speaking, and this Alice thought decidedly uncivil. But perhaps we can't help it. Wait, no. <laughs> but perhaps he can't help it, she said to herself. His eyes are so very nearly the top of her head, or the top of his head, but at any rate he might answer questions. How am I to get in? she repeated aloud. I shall sit here until tomorrow, the footman remarked, and at this moment the door of the house opened, and a large plate came skimming out straight at the footman's head. It just grazed his nose and broke to pieces against one of the trees behind him. Or next day, baby, the footman continued in the same tone, exactly as if nothing had happened. How am I to get in? asked Alice again, this time in a louder tone. Why are you to get in at all? said the footman. That's the first question, you know. It was, no doubt, only Alice didn't like to be told so. It's really dreadful, she muttered to herself. The way all these creatures argue, it's enough to drive one crazy. The footman seemed to think this a good opportunity for repeating his mark, with variations. I shall sit here on and off for days and days. But what am I to do? Anything you like, said the footman, who, became wi who began whistling. Oh, there's no use in talking to him, said Alice desperately. He's perfectly idiotic. And she opened the door and went in. The door went right into a large kitchen, which was full of smoke from one end to the other. The Duchess was sitting on a three-legged stool in the middle, nursing a baby. The cook was leaning over the fire, stirring a large cauldron which seemed to be full of soup. There's, there's certainly too much pepper in that soup, Alice said to herself, as well as she could for sneezing. There was certainly too much of it in the air. At, at that rate, even the Duchess sneezed occasionally, and as for the baby, it was sneezing and howling alternately, without a moment's pause. The only things in the kitchen that didn't sneeze were the cook and a large cat which was sitting on the hearth and grinning from ear to ear. "'Please, would you tell me?' said Alice, a little timidly, for she wasn't quite sure whether it was good manners for her to speak first. "'Why, your cat grins like that?' said the duchess and that's why ping she said the last word with such sudden violence that alice quite jumped but she saw in another moment that it was addressed to the baby and not to her so she took courage and went on again i, I didn't know cheshire cats always grinned in fact i didn't even know cats could grin we all can we all can and most of them do i don't know of any that do, said Alice very politely, feeling quite pleased to have gotten into such a conversation. You don't know much, and that's a fact, said the Duchess. Alice did not at all like the tone of this remark, and thought it would be well to introduce some other top and thought it would be well to introduce some other subject of conversation. While she was trying to fix on one, the cook took the cauldron of soup off the fire and at once set to work throwing everything within her reach of the duchess and the baby. The fire irons came first, then followed a shower of saucepans, plates, and dishes. The duchess took no notice of them even when they hit her, and the baby was howling so much already that it was quite impossible to, to say whether the blows hurt or not. 
Oh, please mind what you're doing, cried Alice, jumping up and down in an agony of terror. Oh, there goes his precious nose, as an unusually large saucepan flew by it and nearly carried it off. If everybody minded their own business, the Duchess said in a hoarse, nasally growl. The world will go round a deal faster than it does. Which would not be an advantage, said Alice, who felt very glad to get an opportunity of showing off some of her work. Just think of what work it would make with the day and night. You see, the Earth takes 24 hours to turn around on its axis. Talking of axes, trap off her head! Alex, Alice glanced. Alice glanced. There's definitely an R in glanced, you buffoon. No. Alice glanced rather anxiously at the cook to see if she meant to take the hint, but the cook was busily stirring the soup and seemed to not be listening, so she went on again. Twenty-four hours, I think. Or is it twelve? I... Oh, don't bother me. I could never have had figures. And with that, she began nursing the child again, singing a sort of lullaby to it as she did so and giving it a violent shake at the end of every line. Speak roughly to your little boy, and beat him when he sneezes. He only does it to annoy, because he knows it teases. Wow, wow, wow! <laughs> While the Duchess sang the second verse of the song, she kept tossing the baby violently up and down, and the poor little thing howled so that Alice could hardly hear the words. I speak severely to my boy. I beat him when he sneezes. For he can thoroughly enjoy the pepper when he pleases. Wow, wow, wow. Here, you may nurse it a bit if you like. The Duchess said to Alice, flinging the baby to her as she spoke. I must go and get ready to play croquet with the Queen. And she hurried out of the room. The cook threw a frying pan after her as she went out, but he just missed. Alice caught the baby with some difficulty as it was a strangely shaped little creature and held, a, held out its arms and legs in all directions, just like a starfish, thought Alice. The poor little thing was snorting like a steam engine when she caught it, and it kept doubling itself up and straightening itself out again, so that altogether for the first minute or two it was as much as she could do to hold it. As soon as she had made out the proper way of nursing it, which was to twist it up into some sort of knot, and then keep tight, its, tight hold of its right ear and left foot so as to prevent it undoing itself, she carried it out into the open air. If I don't take this child away with me, thought Alice, they're sure to kill it in a day or two. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be murder to leave it behind? She said the last words aloud, and the little thing grunted in reply. Thankfully, it had left off sneezing by this time. Don't grunt, that's not at all a proper way of expressing yourself. The baby grunted again, and Alice looked very anxiously into its face to see what was the matter with it. There was no, there could be no doubt that it had a very turn-up nose, which looked more like a snout than a real nose. Also, its eyes were getting extremely small for a baby, although Alice didn't like the look of the thing at all. But perhaps it was only sobbing, she thought and looked into its eyes again to see if there were any tears. No, there were no tears. If you're going to turn into a pig, my dear, said Alice seriously, I'll have nothing more to do with you. Mind now. The poor little thing sobbed again, or grunted. It was impossible to say which, and they went on for some while in silence. Alice was just beginning to think to herself, Now what am I to do with this creature when I get at home? When it grunted again so violently that she looked down into its face in some alarm. This time there could be no mistake about it. It was neither more nor less than a pig, and she felt that it would be quite absurd for her to carry it any further. So she set the little creature down and felt quite relieved to see it trot away quietly into the wood. If it had grown up, she said to herself, it would have made a dreadfully ugly child, but I'd say it makes a rather handsome pig. And so, and so she began thinking over other children she knew, who might do very well as pigs, and was just saying to herself, if one only knew the right way to change them, when she was a little startled by seeing none other than the Cheshire cat sitting on a bow of a tree a few yards off. The cat only grinned when it saw Alice. It looked good-natured, she thought, 
Still, it had very long claws and a great many teeth, so she felt it ought to be treated with respect. Cheshire Cat, she began rather timidly, as she did not at all know whether it would like the name. However, it only grinned a little wider. Come, it's pleased so far, thought Alice, and she went and she carried on. Well, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? Hmm. <laughs> That depends a great deal on where you want to get to. I don't much care where. Then it doesn't matter which way you go. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure enough to do that if you only walk long enough. Alice felt this could not be denied, so she tried another question. What sort of people live about here? In that direction, the cat said, waving its right paw around, lives a hatter, and in that direction, waving the other paw, lives a march hare. Visit either you like. They're both mad. Oh, but I don't want to go among mad people. Oh, you can't help that, said the cat. We're all mad here. I'm mad. You're mad. How do you know I'm mad? Well, you must be, or you wouldn't have come here. Alice didn't think that proved it at all, but she went on, and how do you know that you're mad? To begin with, said the cat. A dog is not mad, you grant that. I suppose so. Well, then, you see, a dog growls when it's angry and wags its tail when it's pleased. Now I growl when I'm pleased and wag my tail when I'm angry, therefore I'm mad. I call it purring, not growling. Call it what you like. Do you play croquet with a queen today? I should like it very much, but I haven't been invited yet. You'll see me there, said the cat, who promptly vanished. Alice wasn't too surprised at this. She was getting used to these strange things happening. While she was looking at the place where it had been, it suddenly appeared again. By the by, what became of the baby? I had nearly forgotten to ask. Well, it turned into a pig, Alice quietly said, just as if it had come back in a natural way. I, th I thought it would, said the cat, and it vanished again. Alice waited a little, half, half expecting to see it again, but it didn't appear. And after a minute or two, she walked on in the direction in which the March Hare was said to live. I've seen Hatters before, she said to herself. The March Hare will be much the most interesting. And perhaps as this is May, it won't be, well, raving mad. At least not so mad as it was in March. <laughs> Funny. It's May right now. <laughs> as she said this, she looked up and there was the cat again sitting on a branch of a tree. Did you say pig or fig? I said pig, and I wish you wouldn't keep appearing and vanishing so suddenly. You make one quite giddily. All right, said the cat, and this time it vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end of its tail, and ending with a grin which remained some time after the rest of it had gone. <laughs> well, I've often seen a cat without a grin, thought Alice, but a grin without a cat. It's the most curious thing I ever saw in my life. She had not gone much farther before she came in sight of the house of the March Hare. She thought it must be the right house, because the chimneys were shaped like ears, and the roof was thatched with fur. It was so large a house that she didn't like to go nearer till she had nibbled some, of the more, some more of the left-hand bit of the mushroom, and raised herself to about two feet high. Even then she walked up towards it rather timidly, saying to herself, suppose it should be raving mad after all, I almost wish I'd gone to see the Hatter instead. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. A Mad Tea Party. There was a table set out under a tree in the front of the house, and the March Hare and the Hatter were having tea at it. A Dormouse was sitting between them, fast asleep, and the other two were using it as a cushion, resting their elbows on it and talking over its head. Very uncomfortable for the Dormouse, thought Alice. Only it's asleep, so I suppose it doesn't mind. The table was a large one, but the three were all crowded together at one corner of it. 
No room, no room! They cried out when they saw Alice coming. There's plenty of room, said Alice indignantly, and she sat down in a large armchair at one end of the table. Have some wine, said the March Hare in an encouraging tone. Alice looked all round the table, but there was nothing on it but tea. Well, I don't see any wine, she remarked. There isn't any. Then it wasn't very civil of you to offer it, said Alice angrily. It wasn't very civil of you to sit down without being invited. I didn't know it was your table. It's laid for a great many more than three. Your hair wants cutting, said the Hatter. He'd been looking at Alice for some time with great curiosity, and this was his first speech. You should learn to not make personal remarks, Alice said with some severity. It's very rude. The Hatter opened his eyes very wide on hearing this, but all he said was, Why is a ring like a writing desk? Oh, come, we shall have some fun now, thought Alice. I'm glad they've begun asking riddles, I believe. I can guess that, she added aloud. Do you mean th that you think you can find out the answer to it? said the March Hare. Exactly so. Then you should say what you mean, said the March Hare. I, I do, at least, I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. Not the same thing a bit, said the Hatter. You might just as well say I see what I eat is the same thing as I eat what I see. You might just as well say, added the March Hare, that I like what I get is the same thing as I get what I like. You may as well say, added the Dormouse, who seemed to be talking in his sleep, that I breathe when I sleep. It is the same thing It is the same thing with you, said the Hatter, and here the conversation dropped and the party sat silent for a minute, while Alice thought over all she could remember about ravens and writing desks, which oh, wasn't much. The Hatter was first to break the silence. What day of the month is it? he said, turning to Alice. He'd taken his watch out of his pocket. Oh, I'm knocking things over, trying to be cool, picking up my watch. He took his watch out of his pocket and was looking at it uneasily, shaking it every now and again and holding it up to his ear. Alice considered a little and said the fourth. Two days wrong, I told you, but it wouldn't suit the works, he added, looking angrily at the March Hare. Oh, it was the best butter, the March Hare meekly replied. Yes, but some crumbs must have gotten in as well, the Hatter grumbled. You shouldn't have put it in with a bread knife. The March Hare took the watch and looked at it somewhat gloomily. Then he dipped it into his cup of tea and looked at it again, but he could think of nothing better to say than his first remark. It was the best butter, you know. Alice had been looking over his shoulder with some curiosity. What a funny watch. It tells the day of the month and doesn't tell what o'clock it is. Why should it? Does your watch tell you what year it is? Of course not, but that's because it stays, stays the same year for such a long time together. Which is just the case with mine, said the Hatter. Alice felt dreadfully puzzled. The Hatter's remark seemed to have no sort of meaning in it, and yet it was... Certainly made of English words. I don't quite understand you, she said as politely as she could. The Dormouse is asleep, is, rather, the Dormouse is asleep again, said the Hatter, and he poured a little hot tea upon its nose. The Dormouse shook its head impatiently and said without opening its eyes, Of course, of course, there's not just what was I going to remark myself. Have you guessed the real yet? The Hatter said, turning to Alice again. No, I give up. What's the answer? Why, oh, I, uh, I haven't the slightest idea, said the Hatter. Nor I, said the March Hare. Alice sighed wearily. I think you might do something better with time than wasted in asking riddles that have no answers. 
If you knew time as well as I do, said the Hatter, you wouldn't be you would talk about wasting it. It's him. I don't quite know what you mean, said Alice. Of course you don't. Ugh, said the Hatter, tossing his head contemptuously, and apparently knocking his hat upon the floor. <laughs> I dare say you've never even spoke to time. Oh, perhaps not, but I know I have to beat time when I learn music. Ah, that accounts for it, said the Hatter. He won't stand beating. Now, if you only kept on good terms with him, he'd do almost anything you liked with the clock. For instance, suppose it were nine o'clock in the morning, just time to begin lessons. You would only have to whisper a hint to time, and round goes the clock in a twinkling. Half past one time for dinner. I only wish it was, the March Hare said to itself in a whisper. That would be grand, certainly, but then I shouldn't be hungry for it, you know. Not at first, perhaps, said the Hatter, but you could keep it to half past one as long as you like. Is that the way you manage? Alice asked. The Hatter shook his head mournfully. Not I. We quarreled last March just before he he went mad, you know, pointing with his teaspoon at the March Hare. It was the great concert given by the Queen of Hearts, and I had to sing. Twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder what you're at. You know the song, perhaps? Well, I've heard something like it said Alice. It goes on, you know, in this way. Up above the world you fly, like a tea tray in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle. Here the dormouse shook itself and began singing in its sleep. Twinkle, 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 and went on so long they had to pinch it to make it stop. Well, I'd hardly finished the first verse, said the Hatter, when the Queen jumped up and bawled out, He's murdering the time off with his head. How dreadfully savage, exclaimed Alice. And ever since that, the Hatter went on in a mournful tone. He won't do a thing, I asked. It's always six o'clock now. A bright idea came into Alice's head. Is that the reason why so many tea things are put out here? Yes, that's it, said the Hatter with a sigh. It's always tea time, and we've no time to wash the things between whiles. Then you keep moving around, I suppose? Exactly so, as the things get used up. But what happens when you come to the beginning again? Alice ventured to ask. Suppose we change the subject, the March Hare interrupted, yawning. <sighs> I'm getting tired of this. I vote the young lady tells us a story. I'm afraid I don't know one, said Alice, rather alarmed at the proposal. Then the Dormouse shall, they both cried. Wake up, Dormouse! And they pitched it on both sides at once. The Dormouse slowly opened his eyes. I wasn't to sleep. I heard every word you fellows were saying. Tell us a story. Yes, please do, and be quick about it, or you'll be asleep before it's done. Once upon a time there were three little sisters, Dormouse began, suddenly beginning to hurry, and their names were Elsie, Lacey, and Trilly, and they lived at the bottom of a well. What did they live on, said Alice, who always took a great interest in questions of eating and drinking. They lived on treacle, said the Dormouse, after thinking for a moment or two. They couldn't have done that, you know. Alice gently remarked, they'd have been ill. So they were very ill, said the Dormouse. Alice tried to fancy to herself what such an extraordinary way of living would be like, but it puzzled her too much, so she went on. But why did they live at the bottom of the well? Take some more tea, the March Hare said to Alice, very earnestly. I've had nothing yet, so I don't think I can take more, Alice replied in an offended tone. You mean you can't take less? 
It's very easy to take more than nothing, my dear, said the Hatter. Nobody asked your opinion, said Alice. Who's making personal remarks now? The Hatter asked triumphantly. Alice didn't quite know what to say to this, so she helped herself to some tea and bread and butter, and then turned to the Dormouse and repeated her question. Why did they live at the bottom of a well? The Dormouse took again another minute or two to think about it, and then said, It was a treacle well. I don't know why the Dormouse is so old, but oh well. <laughs> There's no such thing! Alice was beginning very angrily, but the Hatter and the March Hare went, shh, shh, shh. And the Dormouse sulkily remarked, If you can't be civil, you'd better finish the story for yourself. No, 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 please go on. I won't interrupt again. I dare say they may be one. One indeed, said the Dormouse indignantly. However, he consented to go on. And so these three little sisters, they were learning to draw, you know. What did they draw? said Alice, quite forgetting her promise. Treacle, said the Dormouse, without considering at all this time. I want a clean cup, interrupted the Hatter. Let's all move one place on. He followed on as he spoke, and the Dormouse followed him. The March Hare moved into the Dormouse's place, and, and Alice, rather unwillingly, took the place of the March Hare. The Hatter was the only one who got any advantage from the change, and Alice was a good deal worse off than before, as the March Hare had just upset the milk jug onto his plate. Alice didn't win did not wish to offend the Dormouse again, so she began very cautiously. But I don't understand. Where did they draw the treacle from? You can draw water out of a water well, said the Hatter. So I should think you could draw a treacle out of a treacle well. Hmm, stupid. But they were in the well, Alice said to the Dormouse, not choosing to notice this last remark. Of course they were well in. This answer so confused poor Alice that she let the Dormouse go on for some time without interrupting it. They were learning to draw, the Dormouse went on, slowing as it yawned and started to rub its eyes. It was getting very sleepy. They drew all manner of things. Everything that begins with an M. Why with an M? Why not? said the March Hare, and Alice was silent. The Dormouse had closed its eyes by this time and was going off into a doze, but on being pinched by the Hatter, it woke up again with a little shriek and carried on. That begins with an M. Such as mousetrap, moon, memory, muchness, did you ever say? You know you say things are much of a muchness. Did you ever see a thing as a drawing of a muchness? Really, now you ask me, said Alice, very much confused. I don't think... Then you shouldn't talk, said the Hatter. This piece of rudeness was more than Alice could bear. She got up in great disgust and walked off. The Dormouse fell asleep instantly, and neither of the others took the least notice of her going, though she looked back once or twice, half hoping that they would call after her. The last time she saw them, they were trying to put the Dormouse into the teapot. At any rate, I'll never go there again, said Alice as she picked her way through the wood. It's the stupidest tea party that I ever was at in all my life. Just as she said this, she noticed that one of the trees had a door leading right into it. That's very curious, she thought. But everything's curious today. I think I may as well go in at once. And then she went. And once more, she found herself in a long hall and close to the little glass table. Now I'll manage better this time, she said to herself, and began by taking the little golden key and unlocking the door that led into the garden. Then she went to work, nibbling at the mushroom, she had kept a piece of it in her pocket, until she was about a foot high. Then she walked down the little passage, and then she found herself at last in the beautiful garden, among the bright flower beds and the cool fountains. Chapter 8 The Queen's Croquet Ground a large rose tree stood near the entrance of the garden. The roses growing on it were white, but there were three gardeners at it, busily painting them red. Alice thought this a very curious thing, 
and she went nearer to watch them, and as just as she came up to them, she heard one of them say, Look out now, Five, don't go splashing paint over me like that. I couldn't help it, said Five in a sulky tone. Seven jog my elbow. On which Seven looked up and said, That's right, Five, I always lay the blame on others. You'd better not talk, said Five. I heard the Queen say only yesterday you deserve to be beheaded. What for? Or, what for? That's none of your business. Wait, no. <laughs> Seven's the shrewd one. That's none of your business, too. Yes, it is his business. And I'll tell him. It was for bringing the cooked tulip roots instead of onions. Seven flung down his brush and had just begun, Well, of all the unjust things, when his eye chanced to fall upon Alice. As she stood watching them, and he checked himself suddenly. The others looked round, looked round also, and all of them bowed low. Would you, would you tell me, said Alice a little timidly, why you are painting those roses? Five and seven said nothing, but looked at two. Two began in a low voice. Well, the fact is, you see, miss, this here ought to be a red rose tree, and we put in a white one by mistake. And if the queen was to find out, we should have all our heads cut off, you know. So you see, miss, we'll do our best before she comes to... At this moment, Five, who had been anxiously looking across the garden, called out, The Queen! The Queen! And the three gardeners instantly threw themselves flat upon their faces. There was a sound of many footsteps, and Alice looked round, eager to see the Queen. First came ten soldiers carrying clubs. These were all shaped like the three gardeners, oblong and flat, with their hands and feet at the corners. Next, the ten courtiers... They were ornamented all over with diamonds and walked two and two, as the soldiers did. After these came the royal children. There were ten of them, and the little deers came jumping merrily along, hand in hand, in couples. They were all ornamented with hearts. Next came the guests, mostly kings and queens, and among them Alice recognized the white rabbit. It was talking in a hurried, nervous manner, smiling that everything w at everything that was said, and went by without noticing her. Then followed the knave of hearts, carrying the king's crown on a crimson velvet cushion. And last of all this grand procession came the king and queen of hearts. Alice was rather doubtful whether she ought not to lie down on her face like the three gardeners, but she couldn't remember having heard of such a rule at processions. And besides, what would be the use of a procession if the people had to all lie down upon their faces so they couldn't see it? So she stood still where she was, and she waited. When the procession came opposite to Alice, they all stopped and looked at her, and the queen said severely, Who is this? She said it to the knave of hearts, who only bowed and smiled in reply. Idiot! said the queen, tossing her head impatiently, and turned to Alice, carrying on. What's your name, child? My name is Alice, if it so please your majesty. Alice said very politely, but added to herself, Why, they're only a pack of cards, after all, I needn't be afraid of them. And what are these? said the queen, pointing to the three gardeners who were lying around the rose tree, for you see, as they were lying on their faces, and the pattern on their backs was the same as the rest of the pack, she couldn't tell whether they were gardeners, or soldiers, or courtiers, or three of her own children. How should I know? Alice said, surprised at her own courage. It's no business of mine. The queen turned crimson with fury, and after glaring her at her for a moment like a wild beast, screamed, nah, 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 nah. Nonsense, said Alice very loudly and decidedly, and the queen fell silent. The king laid his hand upon her arm and timidly said, Consider, my dear, she's only a child. The queen turned angrily away from him and said to the knave, Turn them over. The knave did so very carefully with one foot. Get up, said the queen in a shrill, loud voice. And the three gardeners instantly jumped up and began bowing to the king, the queen, the royal children, and everyone else. Leave on that. You make me giddy. And then turning to the rose tree, she went on. What 
ham even doing here? May it please your majesty, said Two in a very humble tone, going down on one knee as he spoke. We were trying. I see, said the queen, who had meanwhile been examining the roses. Over their heads. And the procession moved on. Three of the soldiers remaining behind to execute the unfortunate gardeners who ran to Alice for protection. You shan't be beheaded, said Alice, and she put them into a large flower pot that stood near. The three soldiers wandered about for a, a minute or two, looking for them, and quietly marched off after the others. I know, shouted the queen. Their heads are gone, if you please, your majesty, the soldier shouted in reply. Miss Marie, can you play croquet? The soldiers were silent and looked at Alice, as the question was evidently met for her. Yes, shouted Alice. Come on then, roared the queen, and Alice joined the procession, wondering very much what would happen next. It's a very fine day, said a timid voice at her side. She was walking by the white rabbit who was peeping anxiously into her face. Fairy, where's the duchess, said Alice. Hush, hush, that's not the queen. I lied. Hush, hush, said the rabbit in a low, hurried tone. He looked anxiously over his shoulder as he spoke, and then raised himself upon tiptoe, put his mouth close to her ear, and whispered, She's under sentence of execution. What for? Did you say what a pity? The rabbit asked. N no, I didn't. I don't think it's at all a pity. I said, What for? Oh, she boxed the queen's ears, the rabbit began, and Alice gave a little scream of laughter. Oh, hush! The rabbit whispered in a frightened tone. The queen will hear you. You see, she came rather late, and the queen said, Get to your mind! <laughs> shouted the queen in a voice of shrill thunder. And people began running about in all directions, tumbling up against each other. However, they got settled down in a minute or two, and the game began. Alice thought she had never seen such a curious croquet, gro croquet ground in her life. It was all ridges and furrows. Paul's were live hedgehogs, the balance live flamingos, and the soldiers had to double themselves up and stand on their hands and feet to make the arches. The chief difficulty Alice found at first was getting in, was managing her flamingo. She succeeded in getting its body tucked away comfortably enough under her arm with its legs hanging down, but generally just as she had got its neck straightened out all nicely and was about to give the hedgehog a blow with its head, it would twist itself round and look up in her face with such a puzzled expression she couldn't help bursting out in laughter, and when she got its head down and was going to begin again, it was very promo provoking to find that the hedgehog had unrolled itself and was in the act of crawling away. Besides all of this, there was generally a, ra a ridge or furrow in the way, whatever she wanted to send the hedgehog to, and as the doubled-up soldiers were always getting up and walking off to other parts of the ground, Alice soon came to the conclusion that it was a very difficult game indeed. The players all played at once without waiting for turns, quarreling all the while, and fighting for the hedgehogs. And in a very short time, the queen was in a furious passion, and went stamping about, shouting, Up the head! Up the head! About once a minute. Alice began to feel very uneasy. To be sure, she had not as yet had any dispute with the queen, but she knew that it might happen any minute. And then, thought she, what would become of me? They're dreadfully fond of beheading people here. The great wonder is that there's anyone, el anyone at all left alive. She was looking about for some way of escape, and wondering whether she could get away without being seen when she noticed a very curious appearance in the air. It puzzled her at first, but after watching in a minute or two, she made it out to be a grin and said to herself, It's the Cheshire Cat. Now I shall have somebody to talk to. How are you getting on? said the cat as soon as there was mouth enough for it to speak with. Alice waited till the eyes appeared, then nodded. It's no use speaking to it till its ears have come, or at least one of them. In another minute the whole head appeared, and then Alice put down her flamingo and began an account of the game, feeling very glad she had someone to listen to her. The cat seemed to think there was more there was enough of it now in sight, and no more of it appeared. I don't think they play at all fairly, Alice began in a rather complaining tone, and they all quarrel so dreadfully one can't hear oneself speak, and they don't seem to have any rules in particular, if there are, and nobody attends to them, and you've no idea how confusing it is, all the things being alive. For instance, there's the arch I've got to go through next, walking about at the other end of the ground, and I should have croqueted the, 
Queen's Hedgehog just now, only it ran away when it saw mine coming. How do you like the Queen? Not at all, she's so extremely. Then she noticed the Queen was close behind her, listening. So she went on. Unlikely to win, it's hardly worth finishing the game. The Queen smiled and passed on. Who? Who are you talking to? I gotta, I gotta get the King of Regal voice one sec. <clears throat> Who are you talking to? said the king, going up to Alice, and looking at the cat's head with great curiosity. It's a friend of mine, a Cheshire cat. Allow me to introduce it. I don't like the look of it at all, said the king. However, it may kiss my hand if it likes. I'd rather not. Don't be impertinent, and don't look at me like that. He got behind Alice as he spoke. A cat may look at a king. I've read that in some book, but I don't remember where. Well, it must be removed, said the king very decidedly, and he called the queen who was passing at the moment. My dear, I wish you would have this cat removed. The queen had only one way of settling all difficulties, great or small. No, then, she said without even looking around. I'll, fix, I'll fetch the executioner myself, said the king eagerly, and he hurried off. Alice thought she might as well go back and see how the game was going on, as she heard the queen's voice in the distance screaming with passion. She had already heard her sentence three of the players to be executed for having missed their turns, and she didn't like the look of things at all. As the game was in such confusion, she never knew whether it was her turn or not, so she went in search of her hedgehog. The hedgehog was engaged in a fight with another hedgehog, which seemed to Alice an accident. Excellent opportunity for croqueting one of them with the other. The only difficulty was that her flamingo had gone across to the other side of the garden, where Alice could see it trying in a helpless sort of way to fly up into a tree. By the time she'd caught the flamingo and brought it back, the fight was over, and both the hedgehogs were out of sight. But it doesn't matter much, thought Alice, as all the archers are gone from this side of the ground. So she tucked it away under her arm that it might not escape again, and went back for a little conversation with her friend. When she got back to the Cheshire Cat, she was surprised to find quite a large crowd collected around it. There was a dispute going on between the executioner, the king, and the queen, who were all talking at once. While all the rest were quite silent and looked very uncomfortable. The moment Alice appeared, she was appealed to by all three to settle the question. They repeated their arguments to her, though as they all spoke at once, she very, she found it very hard indeed to make out just exactly what they'd said. The, ex the executioner's argument was you couldn't cut off a head unless there was a body to cut it off from. He'd never had to do such a thing before, and he wasn't going to begin at this time at his time of life. The king's argument was that anything that had a head could be beheaded, and that you weren't to talk nonsense. The queen's argument was that if something wasn't done about it in less than no time, she'd have everybody executed all round. It was this last remark that had made the whole party look so grave and anxious. Alice could think of nothing else to say, but it belongs to, but it belongs to the duchess. You'd better ask her about it. She's in prison, said the execution. Queen said to the executioner, "Fetch her here." and the executioner went off like an error. The cat's head began fading away the moment he was gone, and by the time he'd come back with the duchess, it had entirely disappeared, so the king and the executioner ran wildly up and down looking for it, while the rest of the party went back to the game. All right, so we're almost at two hours, uh, recorded anyway. There's about half an hour of the actual live stream that, uh, you know, has existed more, and, uh, I think we're going to call it an evening, uh, for now, so this has been Paper Cuts, thank you for tuning in.